70% of investments of Kazanak Capital Management are provided to the economy of Kazakhstan. Funds invested more than 400 million US dollars into the Kazakhstan economy, of which 180 million dollars are sourced from Kazanak Capital Management. More than 40 projects are planned. Funds of Kazuna Capital Management family provide capital to companies.
Hello, everyone. I think we'll uh, get started. Welcome, everyone, to the panel session on the role of private equity for sustainable development. It's a real pleasure and an honor to be with you today. Before we begin, I just wanted to thank our hosts at Kazina Capital Management and the government of Kazakhstan for organizing this discussion uh, here at the Astana Economic Forum. My name is Anikat Shah, and I'll be the moderator for today's panel. I'm the program leader for sustainable finance at the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. We are a global think tank and research network operating under the auspices of the UN Secretary General with a mission to accelerate progress towards sustainable development around the world. In September 2015, the world began its unified march towards sustainable development when all 193 member states of the UN signed on to the Sustainable Development Goals. This is a set of 17 development goals that guide cooperation for economic growth, social inclusion, and environmental sustainability, which is, in my view, a good definition of what sustainable development means. Now, sustainable development can be viewed both as a challenge and as an opportunity. The challenges are well known. We face enormous needs to solve issues of glo global poverty, maintain a safe environment, build new energy systems, and provide more opportunities for a global growing population. These are well-known challenges. But the opportunities are equally significant and less discussed. With the march towards sustainable development, we have the opportunity to build the world's infrastructure, create new industries, solve new problems, and solve issues that humanity has never been able to deal with in the past because of the new technologies that we now have. So it is this perspective of technology and of progress and of opportunity that I want us to focus on today and, this, and in this panel. The achievement of sustainable development will require trillions of dollars of investment, public and private, in industry, in infrastructure, and in services all around the world. Private equity, if channeled appropriately, if structured appropriately, if organized appropriately, can play a critical role in this pursuit. In today's panel, we'll focus on three main topics. First, the role of private equity in sustainable development. Secondly, the challenges and opportunities of private equity in Kazakhstan. And third, a forward-looking agenda to examine what are the needed reforms within the country so that the private equity industry can develop and evolve. We will begin a with a discussion amongst, this amongst our panelists and then move towards questions and answers. We will then have a short presentation from one of our panelists on a new investment vehicle focused on sustainable development investing in Kazakhstan. We have a wonderful panel of experts in private equity investing with us today and I did a quick calculation that there's over 120 years of collective experience in investment in private equity in Kazakhstan and globally just on this panel. So lots of great experience for us to uh, get wisdom from. Before we begin, let me just say that the views and opinions presented here represent only those of the speakers and should not be considered to represent the institutions and organizations that they work for. So, without further ado, let me begin. Marcia, let me start with you. You have two decades plus of experience in emerging market banking, investment management, and portfolio management around the world, including here in Kazakhstan. How do you view the role of private equity in modernization, in economic transformation? What are some of the lessons you've seen here in Kazakhstan and around the world? And why don't we start there to help frame the discussion going forward? Well, first I want to say good morning and thank, thank you all for being here. This is a very important panel, in fact, because the role of private equity has to be considered within the context of Kazakhstan in the context of modernization. 
underpinning everything you said about sustainable development. Modernization. Private equity is not a panacea. It's not going to solve all the issues for the economy. However, private equity is a needed source of capital for development. And what's very interesting about understanding the role of private equity is that in countries where local capital markets are not developed, in countries where you have um, struggling banking systems, in countries where internal capital are not forthcoming or debt is prohibited in terms of interest rates or et cetera, private equity, equity investment can be a very helpful alternative to help in modernization. Now, what do I mean by that? Where do we employ private equity? Why is that important? Private equity would be great for privatization assets that are not ready to go to IPO or when IPOs are too expensive. They're great for corporate restructurings, which is part of modernization as well because you have to improve your value chain or you become obsolete. And that is some of the issues that emerging market companies have and countries is that they cannot keep up with the technology and development. So lower trade barriers, more competition, globalization, does require for you to have more of a process-oriented, technology-oriented innovation. So when you look at the role of private equity and how it could be useful to Kazakhstan, what you have to think about, or the emerging markets in general, is how can private equity help you in innovation? How does it help with innovation? What happened in Asia, for example, is that with private equity, amongst other tools, they leapfrogged economically. And this is where private equity can be a useful policy tool for modernization, when it focuses on innovation, when you bring labor and capital, when you help, yes, capital, human capital, to develop and have higher skills, forced by the efficiency focus of a private equity manager or a private equity partnership. Now, we also have to talk quickly when we talk about modernization and the ushering of private equity. And again, I say it's not a panacea, it's a tool is that you have to have a pillar, you have to have a structure where private equity can flourish. That means governments need to focus on the legal structure of the country, political risk, corporate governance adherence, and the ability to understand that when a private equity manager comes in or investor comes into a company, the goal is for efficiency. With that may be loss of employees, but with that also could be the development of human capital. So that skill sets become more competitive in the country vis-a-vis -vis neighbors. The challenges in Kazakhstan, in my opinion in terms of private equity, is the fact that exit strategies, which are very important for private equity investors, are limited. You don't have a local capital market that is very robust. It's hard to exit through an IPO. So that makes you have to be focused more towards another strategic investor. You don't have a secondary market where um, developed market PE companies can sell to another PE company an asset that they want to offset. So these two challenges are big. And another aspect is sometimes the returns, the risks that initial private investors will look in the country. The returns are not at the same level of what you would see in a developed market, understandably so. So in terms of you know, how do we usher in private equity, grow private equity internally, bring in private equity within the modernization context, in terms of policy, it's important for the country to focus on these Great. key initiatives, these pillars. Marcia, thank, thank you very much. Roland, I'm going to uh, hand it over to you now. You have a long track record as an investor in the region, and you currently serve as the chief investment strategist of Verno Capital. What is your perspective on the macroeconomic setting of Kazakhstan within the context of the broader region? And what does that tell you for the, for the, the needs of sustainable development and for the needs of private equity? Thank you, Annika. Thank you to the panelists. And thank you to the forum for inviting me to, uh, to speak today. If you look at uh, three of the main uh, trends that are taking place globally today, the shift of economic power from the, from the old world in, in Europe and the US towards the new world uh, in Asia and amongst the emerging world. If you look at the way in which commodities are being used globally, 
And if you think about the huge amount of resources that are going into infrastructure investment to create the ability for global trade to grow, Kazakhstan is actually at the center of all of those trends taking place globally at the moment. And that, that I think, creates enormous opportunity for economic change and therefore economic growth in, in Kazakhstan. So to me, it's not about the opportunity in Kazakhstan, it's all about the execution of that opportunity. If the execution can take place, then Kazakhstan can return to the sort of growth rates that it was experiencing uh, 10 years or so ago. So economic growth in Kazakhstan <clears throat> has fallen from around 10% uh, in the 2000s to 5% more recently and down to about 2% right now. Kazakhstan should be growing at more like 5% and that I think is one of the development goals that, uh, that Kazakhstan has. And it will be all about taking the resources that currently exist in Kazakhstan and taking advantage of the position that Kazakhstan is in uh, today. And if that can happen, and I think we're going to be discussing that on this panel, then moving towards those kind of economic growth rates I think is, is, is very possible. Fantastic. Thank you. Aidan, over to you. You are the founder of one of the most prominent investment houses in Kazakhstan, and you have very rich experience in, in investing both here in the local market as well as in different parts of the world. Can you help us understand your experiences in private equity and share some of your expectations about the future of this market here in Kazakhstan? Um, thank you very much and um, many thanks to Kazna Capital Management for this opportunity to, uh, to be panelist today. Yes, um, we set up Visa about 15 years ago and uh, it's uh, pretty easy to be equity investor at the growing market. And, uh, and uh, 15 years ago it was just the beginning of the cycle when the oil prices went up and we've seen a sort of Kazakh economy flourishing. And, um, but at some point we felt that, um, that the assets in Kazakhstan became too expensive. So if you look at a studio, apartment, or oil and gas company, that's been incredibly expensive and we decided to diversify and go west, not really because uh, I'm not sure that um, have enough expertise to, uh, to do that. We looked at the former Soviet Union, the traditional area uh, where people speak Russian, where we understand how the system works and, uh, uh, and we can figure out some cultural traditions. Uh, but not limiting to that, we went further to Nepal, Cambodia, uh, we made some investments there. Uh, we had a couple of principles, never invest uh, in the industries that you don't know, in the country that you don't know. So choose, uh, at least you should know the country or the industry you invest into. Um, and um, it was a pretty, um, uh, pretty amazing model to borrow money, for example, in Kazakhstan, uh, when the banking system in Kazakhstan been pretty successful, maybe too successful. Um, and put uh, those money into the assets in the countries which are, um, let's say, considered more risky, but, uh, uh, but with assets uh, at a reasonable price. It worked, but uh, with the banking crisis in Kazakhstan, we had to, to make some amendments uh, to this model. And we see that now um, there are more opportunities in Kazakhstan. And it's not only with diversification or the effort that the government put on that. Uh, I think that what we see is uh, um, uh, that Kazakhstan is getting more competitive vis-a-vis -vis China. So there is a growth in salaries in China uh, and um, maybe it's a chance that we can get to diversify our economy and to build something new here. Um, Prior to this discussion, we, uh, we talked about what is private equity, and it's difficult to translate it into Russian and to give a definition to that. 
uh, I agree with Marcia that uh, uh, in a country where you have a pretty limited stock market and uh, money flows which are not, uh, uh, which are not uh, serving the role that uh, they have to play in the economy, maybe the private equity, it's, uh, it's a very broad definition. Uh, in fact, it's everything in Kazakh business, putting money in everything in Kazakhstan, it's private equity. And to um, uh, some extent, all of us sitting here or uh, riding the buses on the street were private equity capitalists in this country. <laughs> That's a little bit um, a, a short description of what we're doing in the region and in Kazakhstan Great. as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Oren Basar, let me turn to you, please, as a, as a uh, partner at ADM Capital and also one of the pioneers of private equity investing in this country. Tell us about your experiences operating in the market here. What have been some of the challenges that you've faced and how do you see the market evolving in the years to come? Thank you, Aniket. Um, thanks for uh, the fantastic organization of this event and thanks to KCM for uh, having me on this panel. Um, I just want to play off uh, what has been said by Marcia, Roland, and, and Aidan. Um, and I think, by the way, Aidan is the pioneer. I, I'm Aktibrionak, you know, I'm just right behind him. But um, I think that you know, for private equity, and Marcia touched upon it, it's extremely important. The moment you're walking into the deal, you have to know how you're going to exit. And uh, certainly, um, some of the uh, more common exit opportunities that exist in other markets, such as IPO or a secondary sale, or actually a sale to financial uh, investors, they're not uh, that widespread or wide present, widely present here. So we have to be creative, we have to understand that if we go into a business, we most likely will exit in a shorter uh, you know, lifespan than most PE funds when they go in you know, for 10 years, say, uh, with a shorter position and uh, with a view to attract a, a sponsor. As for the issues, you know, uh, we have a very simple matrix that we apply to our opportunities, which is BME. Uh, it's you know, business itself, how sustainable it is, how uh, whether or not it doesn't make sense or it doesn't, management and exit. I touched upon exit, um, and I have to say that, you know, I've never met a deal or seen a deal that is completely perfect, that has all three criteria that are just a match. So you have to work on one of these. Um, and I'll be interested to hear uh, your experiences, for instance, because I always say that, you know, um, in Kazakhstan, nobody gives you a traditional Western package. No investment banker comes to you with a deal that's perfectly cooked. Uh, you actually have to go out there and, and, and help people to, uh, uh, to be bankable with you. Um, we, ADM invests uh, mostly in, in, in Asia and emerging Europe. Uh, our funds is invest in Kazakhstan. We don't have the luxury uh, of going out, at least I don't have the luxury of going out outside Kazakhstan where, uh, as I done correctly pointed out, some of the assets, or at least the ask of the sponsors for the assets is uh, unreasonable. Um, but you have to work, we work with the uh, small and medium businesses. And I think where I see ourselves contributing to the sustainability, which is reduction of poverty, which is, you know, f fighting against hunger, equal opportunities, uh, decent jobs, pay, respect for the environment, uh, is that we, when we walk into a business, we're trying to behave as custodians, we're trying to behave as stewards of the business, uh, we're taking decisions that are sometimes very difficult to take, uh, but they need to be taken, such as, you know, raise the pay. In the short term, it impacts you in a way that, you know, you lower your EBITDA, perhaps, and then you optimize, you invest in human capital. Again, you know, these are not cookie-cutter solutions that are out there. You can, you know, bring them together, and there you go. Um, you know, there could be a loss of jobs, as you said. There could be, but at the same time, transfer of technology. Uh, Kazakhstan is not a big market, but nonetheless it has to be served with local industries that are local globally. No one's going to transport construction materials from outside. Uh, food needs to be produced locally. Uh, a lot of that stuff. And, and finally, just to top it off, I think that Roland was speaking about global trends, you know, international trade, etc. Um, but I'm going to talk about local trends in Kazakhstan. I think we are seeing that the demographics are still very positive. We're a growing population. 
we're seeing a very positive trend in my view of urbanization. People are moving to the cities and they're trying to starting to consume very differently. The culture changes. You no longer you cook your own food. You uh, you eat uh, out out. You know, like that's why maybe you know Burger King is a great investment <laughs> because you just hit the sweet spot right there. Uh, you you no longer uh, entertain yourself in a community, which I guess is a bit of a loss, but you go and, and look enter for entertainment elsewhere. Um, people tend to, unfortunately, take, tend to get sick more often in, in the cities, or they care about their health care more. So the health care is an opportunity. And definitely with the younger population, and urban population, uh, you know, education becomes, uh, becomes an opportunity. And I think the government has been doing a fantastic job of actually extending opportunities for people for private sector to come and interact through private-public partnerships in education. And I think they're doing a great job now in healthcare, where it's going to happen. Where reforms is still, are still needed, I guess, and I think that KCM is working on these initiatives, is that you need to bypass perhaps an efficient banking system and allow for people to go into penny stocks, allow for people to, to channel their small savings, you know, but savings nonetheless, not through the banking system, but directly to, uh, to, to capital of the companies. So that's, that's my experience, and I guess, you know, as panel goes on, I can share more. Fantastic. Thanks. Before we get to, to Timur, let me uh, turn to Pavel. You recently served as president, CEO, and chairman of TPS Capital, a highly respected investment firm involved in many sectors in Russia. Can you tell us about your experiences in private investing in Russia, how the Russian market evolved over the two decades plus that you've been working in it, and what experiences and lessons that might give us as we think about Kazakhstan, another resource-rich country in, 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 this, in the region? Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I think I will speak uh, Russian because uh, it's uh, for the audience, it's uh, a little bit better, that's my feeling. Um, я, я бы хотел остановиться на нескольких моментах особенностей private equity в странах СНГ. Uh, они состоят в следующем. Uh, первое, uh, сами рынки private equity, они больше контролируются частными uh, и, uh, крупными инвестиционными фондами, конгломератами, uh, можно сказать, олигархами да, и государством, нежели классическими private equity фондами, как это принято на Западе. Есть несколько причин, почему. Uh, собственно говоря, почему у нас в России и в Казахстане нет KKR, нет Blackstone, нет TPG, больших инвестиционных миллиардных фондов. Uh, ответов несколько. Uh, первый... Uh, для успеха private equity нужны три вещи. Нужен deal flow, то есть это поток сделок. Нужен execution, то есть как эти сделки исполняются. И нужен exit. С точки зрения deal flow, нужно понимать, что private equity классический, западный, да, он, это инвестирование очень крупных сумм в существующие бизнесы, которые находятся либо в distress, либо требуют реструктурирования, либо это leverage buyout и так далее. К сожалению, на развивающихся рынках, таких как Россия, как Казахстан, очень сложно получить к сделкам в миллиард долларов доступ, потому что эти сделки совершаются либо государством, либо частными миллиардерами-собственниками. И просто в силу непрозрачности этих рынков фонды, как TPG, они не могут зайти и купить компанию. И больше того, ну, как говорится по-русски, а кто же им даст? Да? Соответственно, эти сделки идут в другом сегменте. Как это улучшать? Да? Как эти вопросы улучшать? Это вопросы прозрачности сделок, это вопросы международной отчетности, вопросы корпоративного управления и так далее, чтобы э, западные инвесторы могли получать доступ к этим сделкам. И это э, изменение институциональной среды. А без этих изменений институциональной среды иностранные инвесторы, они, как они могут прийти? Они могут прийти, но в содружестве с государством. А, таким образом, например, если делается от государства какие-то гарантии а, того, что инвестор, а, будет получать доступ к этим сделкам, б, а, не возникнут какие-то в будущем сложности с, будем уж говорить открыто, да, с отъемом этого бизнеса. И это может осуществляться либо государственными гарантиями, либо созданием специальных инвестиционных фондов, которые соинвестируют вместе с западными инвесторами. И то, что мы видим в России, это целый ряд набор фондов, которые занимаются таким образом привлечением инвестиций в страну. И это и Российский фонд прямых инвестиций, это и Роснана, это фонд Сколково, которые занимаются своими конкретными направлениями и развитием. 
Следующий момент. Если мы говорим о устойчивом развитии, устойчивое развитие... Что это такое? Да? То есть это создание что-то нового. Я понимаю так, что да, может быть, очень многие хотели бы зайти и инвестировать в сырьевой сектор да? или в крупные промышленные предприятия, которые уже существуют и там в кавычках навести порядок. Но навести порядок в западном понимании это довольно часто уволить большое количество людей. Да? Понятно, улучшить corporate governance, но с другой стороны может пострадать социальная сфера. В таких странах, как Россия, как Казахстан, я считаю это неприемлемым. Поэтому применение private equity venture capital на своем опыте в России я вижу в новых, так называемых новых отраслях. То есть это и IT, это телеком, это недвижимость, здравоохранение, это новые отрасли энергетики. И из своего 15-летнего опыта создания крупных конгломератов и реформирования компании от миллиарда долларов до нескольких миллиардов долларов, я вижу, что действительно огромная стоимость инвесторами может быть создана в этих отраслях. И таким образом мы создаем новые рабочие места, мы создаем новые отрасли и новые точки роста. Соответственно, в отраслях в этих важно поощрять государством привлечение иностранных инвесторов и создание некой среды, и среды, в которой инвестору будет комфортно. С моей точки зрения, в Казахстане делается достаточно много в этом направлении, это и создание финансового центра. И а, то, что Казахстан поощряет людей, которые получили западное образование и приехали а, реализовывать а, назад а, на родину, а, и это все вместе создает эту, та, ту самую среду, а, в которой могут возникать эти новые бизнесы, которые нужно поощрять, привлекать иностранных инвесторов и которые будут расти, создавать точки роста. А, Здесь я бы особо хотел остановиться, вот как я говорил, deal flow, да, поток сделок, это мы немножко обсудили. Второй момент – это execution, то есть исполнение. И здесь очень важно, на мой взгляд, это человеческий капитал. Потому что без людей, которые имеют качественное западное образование, мы не можем совершать рывок. Я в свое время постоянно нанимал выпускников из Стэнфорда, и Гарварда, и Уортона, я сам выпускник Стэнфорда, но здесь очень важно проводить такую границу. Да? У нас в России было в 2000-е, в 90 мода на экспатов. И э, действительно платили бешеные деньги, приезжали иностранцы, которые не говорили по-русски, не, не понимали местную специфику. И довольно часто это был такой failure. А, у нас эта мода прошла. И прошла она, собственно говоря, почему? Да? То есть важно не то, что человек закончил Стэнфорд там, или Гарвард, или там, Уортон, да, или Коламбия. А важно еще и в том, что человек понимает местную специфику, человек умеет работать в, в этой стране, он любит эту страну, и он хочет принести пользу этой стране. И мой подход всегда был, я скорее возьму выпускника, неважно, западной бизнес-школы, и который умел работать за рубежом, но не экспата, а человека, который отработал руками в Сибири, да, который почувствовал, как реформировать крупный промышленный завод, и который не боится минус 30 мороза и сложности разговора с рабочими или с местными органами, Потому что этот человек, а, он будет понимать, как создавать value, стоимость в западном понимании, то есть он будет понимать, что нужно производственное предприятие реформировать, смотреть на конкретные точки, да, как создается стоимость в западном бизнесе. С другой стороны, этот человек будет не бояться и не пассовать перед сложностями и регуляторной среды, и общения с местными органами. Он будет понимать, что нельзя с рабочими разговаривать, на английском языке, условно говоря, да, он будет понимать, что такое социальная сфера в этом, и что это, например, градообразующие предприятия, здесь нельзя просто взять всех уволить, и пусть они сами как-то выживают, да. И вот как раз вот эта вот очень важная вещь – это люди. И без вот этих вот людей, без качественных людей, вы не можете совершить трансформацию, совершить тревог. И дальше последний момент – это экзит. Да? То есть как вы выходите из инвестиций, то есть вы должны достаточно дешево зайти в инвестицию, вы должны качественно отреформировать бизнес, вы должны выйти. И здесь тоже вопрос такой. В силу не сильной развитости публичных рынков в наших странах, и, допустим, российский фондовый рынок, он не настолько 
огромный, как нью-йоркский или как лондонский. Да? И рассчитывать на то, что вы любую компанию выведете на IPO и на этом заработаете. Довольно сложно. Соответственно, вы должны понимать, как вы из этого бизнеса будете выходить, кому вы продадите. И здесь тоже очень важно сотрудничество с государством а, и понимание, какие бизнесы будут развиваться, какие бизнесы будут, какие бизнесы покупать. И, и а, в частности, я это очень сильно наблюдал у нас в Стэнфорде, в Силиконовой долине. А, успешные венчурные инвестиции, венчурных фондов, ну, вы знаете все истории, Facebook, Google и так далее были основаны венчурными фондами у нас в Стэнфорде. Так вот, оказывается, да. Довольно часто успех этих венчурных инвестиций зависит от того, что какая-нибудь Sequoia, как инвестиционный фонд, она сидит на борде Microsoft, она сидит на борде Google, она сидит на борде Facebook. И она не просто там сидит, она знает, какие технологии и какие компании потребуются в будущем через 5 лет. Соответственно, фонд Sequoia, он инвестирует свои миллиарды долларов в те компании, которые он понимает, как он сможет продать. И далеко Далеко не факт, что эти компании выйдут на IPO, но зато они, он знает, что Google купит вот эту новую технологию. Соответственно, что можно сделать у нас и что я вижу делается в России, да, и то, что на Петербургском форуме да, Владимир Владимирович говорил о том, что нам нужно двигаться в то, что крупные корпорации должны создавать свои собственные инвестиционные фонды. Мало того, что у нас есть в России Сколково, да, и есть институты развития, которые поощряют инвестиции, но и без спроса крупных корпораций, таких как, ну, например, газовые отрасли, в нефтяной отрасли, без спроса на инновации, эти инновации не будут появляться, не будут финансироваться. Когда появляется спрос на инновации, то появляется группа инвесторов, которые финансируют стартапы и Angel Invest на, на ранних стадиях, которые вырастают в корпорации, которые потом покупают уже крупные структуры. Если мы понимаем, что у нас в газовой отрасли нужны новые технологии, или у нас в, в альтернативной энергетике, в зеленой энергетике нужны новые технологии, и мы говорим о том, что мы поощряем инвестиции в это стартапов, тем самым мы а, создаем рабочие места новой компании, которые растут, с другой стороны мы понимаем, что э, иностранные инвесторы или местные инвесторы, они войдут в эти компании, потому что они понимают, что через несколько лет крупные газовые и нефтяные компании будут иметь спрос на покупки. Тем самым мы гарантируем этот самый экзит. С точки зрения выхода через IPO, это такая палка о двух концах. То есть, с одной стороны, в России и в других странах СНГ было создано достаточно большие состояния а, окей, на выходе на IPO. С другой стороны, мы достаточно часто видим, что слишком высокие нормативные требования IPO, которые налагаются на компании, они приводят к тому, что не совсем удобно становится государством этими компаниями управлять. Спасибо. Thank you. That, a lot of great material for us to come back to during the discussion. Just um, before we move into the broader discussion, Timur, I have uh, a couple of questions for you. Uh, you are a principal at Blackstone, which is arguably the world's most prestigious and respected private equity firm. Um, so my, my two questions for you are, one, how do you think about Kazakhstan and the private equity opportunities here versus a, the global set of opportunities? Because as a firm, you are looking at opportunities all around the world. And maybe before that, you have a rich experience in doing private equity in developed markets. What do those lessons teach you and teach us about where this market needs to go? for private equity to play the role that it can play in an economy and in a financial market. Sure. Thank you, Aniket. Uh, uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me an opportunity to participate. I'm a native of Kazakhstan myself, but uh, spent most of my career in the United States, so I'm looking a little bit outside in. Uh, so I don't have the wealth of local experience that some of my co-panelists have, but uh, uh, I can hopefully comment uh, from, the, from the point of view of somebody who knows and loves the country but perhaps has a bit more an outsider perspective on the, uh, on the market here. Uh, I would say the main uh, observation I have about private equity in the, in the developed markets is that uh, private equity is, uh, just like any other asset class, is, is a tool that's designed for a particular purpose. 
and the purpose is housing investments that have a uh, long horizon uh, required to realize value. So it's an orientation to, to hold for five, seven years, or maybe longer. Some of the more recent uh, private equity funds have holding horizons of 10, 12, 15 years, uh, which usually implies that it's, it's a tool that's used to invest in, uh, in assets that require uh, fairly deep transformation to create value. It's also a tool that's used to, uh, to address opportunities that have unusual non-standard risks. Because unlike public markets where everything is standardized and designed for, uh, you know, originally retail investor, now mostly institutional investors, but nonetheless designed with fairly standard set of parameters in mind, uh, private equity tends to address opportunities that, are, uh, that require much more customization. And uh, those are really the features that create an opening for private equity investors in the developed markets. Uh, a lot of the other things that I would, I would talk about have already been touched upon. Obviously, developed markets have the, the benefit of uh, predictable regulatory system, uh, developed financial markets, and, and just the mindset that's, uh, that's trained over the years uh, that the industry existed. Uh, those would be some of the challenges for Kazakhstan, but uh, some of the things that maybe at earlier stage here also present opportunities. I think uh, somebody commented earlier that this is a small market. Uh, this, while presenting some challenges, also presents a big opportunity, and now I'm getting into the second question, how would we think about Kazakhstan vis-a-vis -vis other markets? Uh, the opportunity presented by the size and scale here is that this country, my country, has uh, an ambitious uh, and strategically minded government that has a set of priorities that it's willing to put resources behind. Uh, at the scale of Kazakhstan, that kind of behavior can produce very visible results relatively quickly because we're not trying to move a super tanker, we're trying to move an agile ship. And uh, private equity being the asset class that can adapt to an unusual risk profile and that can think long term uh, is the right asset class to align with this set of strategic priorities. Uh, so absolutely, like many speakers commented, uh, private equity in Kazakhstan will require a partnership with government. But the exciting thing here is that that kind of partnership can yield results that will be visible on a scale of this country. And, and that is really the opportunity. This is something that distinguishes mm -hmm. Kazakhstan from a lot of other markets. It's a place where uh, alignment with with a government that's increasingly transparent, increasingly uh, ambitious, this event and a few other initiatives recently, I think, uh, uh, very clearly indicate the desire to modernize and uh, create conditions for uh, successful investing here. Uh, all those things present opportunities to, uh, to partner with government, partner with uh, state agencies, and. Uh, uh, invest in strategic industries uh, and create oppor opportunities that, that are hard to replicate elsewhere. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So let me uh, put a question out for the panel and we'll see where, where the conversation goes. Love your take on uh, Kazakhstan through the prism of different sectors. This is, of course, a natural resource uh, rich country. Uh, but as we heard from Oren Basar, there's a lot of uh, other trends and opportunities that are happening at a country level. Is private equity only focused here on uh, commodities and infrastructure? Or how do we think about the different opportunity sets in the services, in consumer goods? and other sectors that uh, are driving the new Kazakhstan. Maybe I'll turn to you, Ambassador, to start, and then we can move on. Well, thanks. Um, we are precluded in our funds uh, by the mandate of the funds themselves to, to invest into natural resources. But I'm sure that um, you know, that's, that's a completely different subset and perhaps a very interesting subset of investment opportunities. Uh, we have. Um, uh, also recently, just recently, uh, started to invest in agriculture. Mm -hmm. But in general, as I mentioned before, there's three trends that, um, you know, again, it's something that, that we believe, uh, maybe others uh, view it differently. They will be driving the opportunities set here. 
So definitely, you're, you're seeing a lot of the B2C uh, emergence here in retail businesses, uh, et cetera. The, the issue is the scale, of course, you know, and the traditional private equity houses with the deals like Pavel was mentioning up to a billion dollars probably will not be interested in that. But I know that it's a different subset of opportunities. Roland will speak to that. Uh, at the end of the panel, he will show us that, you know, Kazakhstan as a country presents a great, not just a local infrastructure, but a throughput, part of the whole, uh, you know, economic reorientation that's happening in the world, and that's a different subset of opportunities that I will not speak to. But I wouldn't dismiss out of hand Kazakhstan's ability to create a very vibrant and, I think, sustainable uh, middle businesses. Mm. And our role as a private equity is to take them from that, you know, or meet them halfway, meet them in this precarious stage where just growing and they've grown enough to become, you know, a bigger business. Maybe a regional leader, you know, maybe, uh, maybe uh, it's, a, it's a company that's going to start exporting their, you know, consumer goods to the region. And we're, we, we don't have to limit ourselves just to Kazakhstan. If you look around, uh, you know, with Uzbekistan opening, uh, I believe we can foster regional cooperation that will bring, you know, prosperity to, to all the countries. I think that's another, mm. you know, sustainability goal. You know, you need to have prosperous and, 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 and uh, stable uh, neighbors. And I think that the Kazakh businesses can explore that. They can also explore opportunities that China definitely presents to them. Perfect. Roland. Yeah, I mean, just to pick up on that, when, when, when you're looking at any investment opportunity, whether it's in Russia or, or, or Kazakhstan or globally, you, you're, you're basically looking for, uh, for, for three things. You're looking for something that offers value, something that offers growth, and something where there's a, there's a catalyst for, for change. And, and in Kazakhstan, that often comes, uh, I think, in areas that are outside of the oil and gas sector, outside of the natural resource sector. There are opportunities there. But you know, if you think about where you're going to see value, growth, and change, it's going to come in the consumer market, potentially in infrastructure, given the, the, the investment that's going to go, uh, it's going to go into that sector, um, in finance, logistics. You know, there are many sectors which, which will go through um, a lot of change that are undervalued at the moment because of the absence of capital coming into the country and which can generate substantial growth as they go through that change. So I think those are the opportunities that are there. And just to pick up a, a comment uh, that was being made earlier on, I think by, by Timur, um, when we're thinking about private equity in Kazakhstan, often we talk about the challenges that are faced by private equity, uh, the absence of an exit uh, uh, strategy, um, the absence of deep capital markets in the country. Uh, the, the amount of uh, bureaucracy that sometimes exists. All of those things are, 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 are the case in Kazakhstan. They're also the case in Russia. But those barriers actually are also what creates the opportunity. Because if those barriers were not in place, and it was an easy place to do, uh, to do business, then people like Blackstone would have come in here a long time ago and you know, basically crowded out the, the, the rest of us. And you know, part of our job, I think, as private capital managers is to find ways in which we can first um, work through those barriers, understand what those difficulties and challenges are, and put together investment opportunities knowing those challenges and using the expertise that we've got. And secondly, working alongside the government, when a government is willing to try and change, which I think it really is very much in Kazakhstan right now, to bring the expertise that we have as private capital managers to work alongside the government to meet those challenges and thereby open the opportunity up to, in the future, the likes of the, the, the large multinationals like Blackstone to, to come into the, the market. Uh, so, you know, to me, the barriers that exist actually offer the opportunity to make uh, better uh, returns in, in, uh, in Kazakhstan and places like Kazakhstan. So just uh, piggybacking off of that, it, it seems like one of the important aspects here is, is local knowledge and local experience. And this is a point that was made earlier about Russia and, and also here in Kazakhstan. How as private investors do you actually develop that local knowledge that moves beyond the headlines and moves beyond the sort of facile descriptions of a country? to really understand what's going on outside the capital cities and the opportunities that are there. Aidan, maybe I can turn to you for some of your experience in this space. 
uh, I wouldn't uh, overestimate the local knowledge because um, um, the world is pretty much global. You have social networks, you have uh, press, internet, and uh, uh, looking at our team, for example, we have a multinational team, and um, in fact, the day-to-day -day business is run by an European guy who doesn't speak Russian or Kazakh, but who's based in uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, there are local people with some international experience. So, uh, I would say that uh, it's more important in countries like Uzbekistan or Kyrgyzstan mm -hmm. when uh, it's not about figures, it's not about financial model, it's not about uh, that, it's more about uh, how to deal with the head of the local police <laughs> or <laughs> uh, how to talk to some politicians and so on. Uh, but um, obviously it's a kind of expertise you can, you can buy and you can get. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, coming back to the previous question about Kazakhstan and oil and gas and um, that, it's a kind of dilemma I'm thinking about for a while because um, if you look at what's going on in the world, all these Tesla stories and uh, all that, uh, in order to invest in Kazakhstan you should be a big believer into oil and gas. Uh, because uh, despite all the efforts to diversify the economy and uh, create some new industries, it's still a long way to go. And uh, if you are such a believer in oil and gas, uh, maybe it's better to buy oil and gas rather than retail or other businesses, so just go to, to the core of that. Uh, Another question, if you believe in oil and gas, maybe there are other places in the world where you can put your money and to get more profit out of that. If you are not believing in oil and gas, then don't come here, or well, what is that? And uh, it's a kind of, um, um, it's a question I, I cannot uh, find answer for myself. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I think we, um, uh, we live in the, in the world that's, that's changing pretty quickly and uh, somehow unpredictable and uh, unfortunately we're not sitting on the board of Microsoft like Sequoia to, <laughs> to make our judgment about that. But once again uh, uh, we have to go and to find out some special opportunities, some special deals um, and uh, maybe that is what is the local expertise and the local presence? It brings you, uh, it, it allows you to, to be in the right place in the right time. That's, a, that's, that's the purpose of that. Can I just j jump in here? I want to challenge just for fun, because otherwise we're just going to keep <laughs> talking. You know, we're talking about private equity as if it's a uniform thing. It's not. So let's just make sure the audience understands. $2 billion investment versus a $10 million investment, very different parameters, very different risk reward, very different strategy. So, contextually speaking, yes, oil and gas, gotcha. Yes, um, um, processing. But let me give you a little bit of experience of perhaps Brazil. Okay? I remember when Brazil, no one paid attention, no investment banker wanted to go there. Brazil looked at its vast agriculture, land opportunity, and decided to become an agrotech hub. They maximized the processing of agriculture. They went out and started to have efficiencies in technology, not just creating the next Microsoft, but from seedling development to the processing of being able to, to develop agriculture to the ways of getting to product uh, efficiency. There's a lot to go, but they became leaders and they started actually to grow their internal market that's going out and buying international companies. I go back to my, my original point. The government, and you look at KCM and all the sponsors here, have to be focusing, focusing as well as in innovation. Private equity that brings in innovation. Innovation is not a fit-all term. Innovation can be the next Microsoft, the next Google, the next Agrotech. It can also be processes and logistical um, improvements within a value chain that makes your company or a small company or a medium company or a large company more efficient. And I think that human capital development towards that, um, strategic partnerships through private equity to transfer knowledge and human capital development, there's absolutely no reason why, no reason why private equity cannot be a tool for innovation in this country. You have the education, you have the people, 
you have the want, you have the support of the government. I mean, let's be very clear. You have the AIFC coming out, taking away a lot of the legal risks, ushering a lot of the investment. So I think that innovation is something that we should consider, not just a traditional, let's get another shopping mall. Let's look at ways that we, Kazakhstan, can create, create a competitive advantage. Brazil looked at that. Asia looked at that. And they leapfrogged economically. Your competitive advantage is one of the agendas that private equity should fit within the policy of government. And I just wanted to make sure we, we keep that in mind. Yeah, let, let, let me build on that. I think um, that is exactly right. Uh, the analysis of natural competitive strengths is, is probably the first step in defining the sectors that are attractive. And it's also definitely true that uh, private equity is not a uniform asset class. There are different scales, different, different structures that, that are involved. So when looking at Kazakhstan and thinking about which sectors attract what flavor of private equity, uh, sectors that are globally relevant, where Kazakhstan has comparative advantage in trade, are probably the ones that would attract the likes of global multinational firms because they enable scale and also uh, that is where foreign firms can add some value by transferring technology, transferring best practices that are frankly the same in the sector everywhere in the world. And that's already happening in Kazakhstan via foreign direct investment. So the oil fields are developed by oil majors today with obviously the collaboration of uh, uh, local national uh, producers as well. So where, where private equity could play a role is helping develop the ecosystem around that. There's a whole world of services that surround oil and gas, metals, and so forth. Those are labor-intensive industries that can create jobs, that can create uh, human capital development opportunities and profits for investors. So that's, a, that's an interesting space for private equity. Uh, the other advantage the country has outside of the primary industries is just its geographic location. So being at the crossroads of Eurasia is, is, is valuable. So transportation and logistics is another sector where uh, large foreign private equity firms can be relevant. Uh, when it comes to consumer and retail sectors that generally focus on local market, that's probably where uh, funds that originate locally and that uh, operate locally will always have an edge, and that's where private equity at a different scale of a different kind will always be uh, the right solution. Uh, so the answer, of course, is, uh, as always, uh, uh, not, not, not singular. I, I have a, a friend who uh, recently went into a, into a large tech investing company and I, I gave him a call and, and I was asking him about you know, tech, how do we get involved in tech? There seems to be a lot of money that you can make in tech. Everybody's investing and making these enormous returns. And he said to me, you know, Roland, you, you, you dinosaur, everything nowadays is tech. There's, having a tech fund is almost becoming uh, irrelevant. Every, every industry that you go into in some way or another is connected to technology. If you invest into retail, you're investing in some way in technology, finance, logistics. And I think in, in Kazakhstan in, in, in particular, the, the, the scope for change in all industries is, is, is still large. You don't actually have to be investing into a specifically tech company. You can be bringing new ways of doing business and new, new ideas about how to do business in almost any area. And it's those efficiency gains that will really drive, uh, drive value and change. Let me uh, move the conversation to partnerships and the role of the government. Uh, we heard, I think, from all of you the importance in some regard of how government can help facilitate investment, they can mitigate certain risks and so on. What would be one or two very clear areas that you all think the government of Kazakhstan can support and help drive the private equity industry? Very specific, based on your experiences within the country and also externally. Yeah, please. Um, by the way, I will speak later in, in, in defense of the shopping malls. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> Look, it's, it's, you know, okay, I'll, I'll talk, about, talk shopping about shopping malls, We can talk about shopping malls, too, if you want to. <laughs> Look, I think that, uh, full disclosure, we invest into a chain of cinemas. You create a chain of cinemas, 
Okay, people come and watch the cinemas. The old model where you have a standalone theater doesn't work. Okay, we don't have the population density that would allow a lot of street retail. People go to the mall and there is a multiplicative effect. Besides, you know, there is technology, as you said, Roland, right? And then the, the malls start buying. And they, for instance, the, the local grocery stores start buying in mass, in bulk, which actually stimulates production in bulk, stimulates industrial standards, etc. As for the technology investment role, I think, you know, the guys who do tech, tech in Kazakhstan, and I know some of them, they are not competing for the Kazakh money or private equity money locally. They go to Silicon Valley. It's fairly obvious. So if we talk about that, then we have to say the money that comes into the economy, stays in the economy, multiplies in the economy, rather than elsewhere. I mean, tech is fantastic if you, if you have a gaming company, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but they're on a completely different level. Um, the difficulties, uh, as, you, you know, as you mentioned, it's, they're numerous. I guess sometimes it, it's actually useful to know Kim of Taraz as well, but um, they, they shouldn't be construed as, a, as a, again, you know, I think this overarching theme here is an obstacle, uh, but it's, it's a challenge and an opportunity. So going ahead with that, you know, like with open eyes, with full knowledge that you can do that, uh, you know, really helps you. We are doing deals that are between five and $10 million. Transaction costs alone, um, you know, they constitute a huge amount compared to, to, to the big deals. And the fact is that if you do due diligence for a, you know, $100 million deal, it still costs you the same as for $5 million deal. So there are a lot of tiny, teensy little details and aspects, but if you're committed to doing it, you know, looking at the local ops, then, then you have to very clearly and openly acknowledge that you're willing to, do, to be in this market. Uh, of course, you know, there's 160 countries around the world, but for whatever reason, you know, you have to, and the government, the way it helps, and the way it, they, they could help us, uh, it's a uh, legislation, you know, of course, it's not a secret. A lot of people are trying to create, either, either taking the investment vehicles offshore altogether and created, creating them under the English law, uh, or uh, they're trying to construe this, you know, shareholders' agreements, etc., within the limits of Kazakh law, uh, but obviously knowing that there are gaping holes in that. You know, minority protection is a big thing. How do you... How do you make sure that your rights as a minority shareholder of, say, 25, 30% are as good as 50? Uh, those things. And, you know, Astana International Financial Center, you know, you can be very cynical about it and say it's going to be a flop or whatever, but I think until you, unless you try it, you know, it's like one flew over the cuckoo nest, you know, until, unless you try, you never know what's going to come out of this. Marcia, I think you have a well, just, comment there. I think that you see the government actually moving towards addressing some of the issues. Even if we talk about the Stan International Financial Center, the mere fact that they now will be under English law is a huge step forward in terms of the government support. I mean, one of the things we can't make believe that it's not important, it is a game shift for investors. I routinely talk to investors in New York and around the world who say, okay, well, give me more about the AIFC. How can I actually have that English law protection? What exactly are the qualifications to come? They're, they're paying attention and they're sitting up because they want not only the incentives, but they also want the protection. So I think that Kazakhstan is making some inroads. And as far as I remember, on, in terms of minority rights, um, Kazakhstan actually increased in the world ranking. Okay, so there's another thing. Let's not get beholden to passe knowledge. You need to innovate your knowledge as well. You need to be up to date on what's happening. Kazakhstan has improved its minority ranking in terms of shareholder protection. Kazakhstan is coming in and saying for certain sectors within the Astana International Financial Center, we're going to have English law. We're going to give incentives. We're making worker passes to come in a lot easier. You know, there's, there's a lot of very positive moves forward. And, you know, it's very good for the country to actually embrace them because they will provide extra channels of investment into the country. Just think about this. If the AIFC, which I hope is successful, you're going to have more international investors coming in, bringing more knowledge, being part of the policy narrative that you want, looking for auxiliary services, transferring knowledge, and everything we discussed here, from the way you put your shopping malls to technology, is all innovation. It's all innovation. That's why I keep saying not technology, I say innovation. So I think that these type of moves have to be ushered, supported, and, and nurtured. 
And again, what Blackstone, that I know very well, does and looks for is different than what Ambassador looks for or what Aidan looks for. So let's stop only dictating what internal, I mean, sorry, external investors want. We need to start creating an environment where internal investors from all levels of private equity investment are nurtured to create an environment of culture. And so that's what I think is important. Having that tension is very important. Having that development is very important. If I may come back to the original question, uh, I think there is a general framework for thinking where the government can step in, and it's actually not that different from, uh, from a framework one would apply when thinking about securitization in a private market. Uh, securitization is basically a process by which risk and return is matched to the right investor. So an investor that does more diligence, has more control, tends to take more risk and earn a higher return for doing that extra work. Uh, a part of that is some investors bear, can bear certain risk and other investors can bear certain other kind of risk. So, and that usually is dictated by who has best way to diligence that risk, to understand it, has the most information about it. So with that framework in mind, what are the areas where government fundamentally has more information and can quantify and diligence to risk more than the private investor? Those areas are the direction of regulatory change and things like currency. So those probably are the two risks that are very difficult for private sector to, to bear. So anything that the government can do to insulate the investor from those risks will stimulate capital inflow because all other risks related to whether the enterprise works out, uh, cyclical economic risks, uh, global commodity pricing, all of that is fair game for private sector to, to study and understand. But specific currency, specific regulatory environment, those are the things that the government fundamentally knows better and can help manage. And uh, building on what Marcia said, I do agree that the financial center and a special economic zone here in Astana is definitely a step in the right direction. Obviously, it's early days, but uh, hopefully uh, it's off to a good start. And, uh, it will demonstrate its effectiveness and that will attract some interest. Great. Well, I think um, it's now time we open it up for questions and answers from the audience. So let me uh, turn it over to all of you and you can ask your question in English or in Russian and it can be directed towards one of the panelists or to the entire panel, please. And please just if you can introduce yourself too. Do we have microphones? Okay. Yeah. Sure. So, um, I I don't know, you said that Kazakhstan, in comparison to 15 years ago, was more attractive. Why? And second, what spheres were the most attractive, in your opinion? This is for you and Pavel. If you were to invest in Kazakhstan, where would you invest in the whole? My name is Janat Alimanov, I am a member of the Director of the Bank of Развития. Thank you. Спасибо большое. Я немного уже говорил, что э, нам повезло начать наш бизнес в тот момент, когда цикл э, нефтяных, нефтяной цикл только в начале был. То есть легко развивать бизнес, когда все растет, и экономика растет там, 10 лет подряд или 12 лет подряд высокими темпами. Э, то есть в этом плане нам повезло. Но другая проблема, что активы становятся дорогими. И, ну, этот феномен описан экономистами, да, и поэтому в какой-то момент мы решили, что Казахстан стал непривлекательным из-за того, что дорогие активы. Я не беру вопросы регуляторные, вопросы, там, насколько у нас независимы суды, насколько высок или невысок уровень коррупции, насколько правительство предпринимает усилия по улучшению делового климата. Оно где-то происходит, что-то становится улучшается, что-то ухудшается, но базово, если посмотреть фундамент, то все опять же упирается в цены на нефть. 
И после того, как наступил кризис, который считается, что он продолжается в Казахстане, но в мире он давно уже закончился, но тем не менее наш народ уверен, что кризис продолжается, тем не менее мы пришли к какому-то новому уровню понимания цен, которые стали более реалистичными. Наконец-то какая-то происходит очистка в банковском секторе, которая ну, должна необходимый вот этот вот поток крови в организме да, деловом улучшить. Ну и опять же, что еще происходит, это то, что я упомянул, что в Китае растут доходы населения, в этой связи мы уже не выглядим настолько уж дорогими по сравнению с ними, как, как место для работы. Поэтому Казахстан становится снова более привлекательным, как мне кажется. Ну, обычно принято вот последние годы достаточно критически оценивать, что происходит, но меня немного поражают темпы роста экономики в этом году. Я как бы боюсь загадывать, но у меня хорошее ощущение, что мы, как бы цикл заканчивается, что, что может быть и оно и надолго, и, и хорошо. Хорошо бы было, конечно. Но опять же нужны вот эти вот институциональные вещи, о которых мы говорили, что чтобы привлекательной страны улучшается, мне кажется, не сколько от форумов, хотя они, может, иногда тоже нужны, а от каких-то там вещей, там суды, независимость, там отменили визы, да, вот, например, гражданам ОСД, да, и, на мой взгляд, оно больше сделало, да, чем, чем очень много других вещей, хотя, в общем-то, денег больших не стоило и, и произошло лучше. Ну, в общем, мы... Казахстану снова стали более оптимистичны, ну как инвесторы. Да? Понятно, что это подход инвесторов, это не подход правительства или там государственных организаций, которые не должны так смотреть на эти вещи. Да? У них другие еще факторы в голове, как то создание рабочих мест, создание новой индустрии и прочее. И прочее. Но если взять вот, ну, чисто умозрительный подход инвестора, мне кажется, ситуация улучшается и привлекательность повышается. Опять же, нужно искать специальные возможности, то, что называется special opportunities. Мне кажется, вот реструктуризация банковского сектора, она может создать множество возможностей в этом деле. То есть не до, как бы сказать, не до, не до расчищенный банковский сектор, он создавал слишком много диспропорций каких-то ценовых на рынке, на рынке недвижимости, какие-то нереализованные залоги, скрытые плохие кредиты. Оно создавало очень много иллюзий у, по поводу стоимости активов. По, по, в связи с расчисткой банковского сектора, я надеюсь, что оно еще больше придет к реальности. Можно я задам? Попробую ответить на ваш вопрос. Я бы хотел вернуться вот к теме инвестировать в нефть или инвестировать в проекты в Казахстане. Да, с одной стороны, да, есть прямая зависимость между ценами на нефть, между курсом национальной валюты и между индексом рынка да, фондового. Как обычно чаще всего инвесторы оцениваются? Инвесторы оцениваются, вы лучше рынка работали или вы хуже рынка работали? Да? Если мы посмотрим, например, на рейтинг Forbes самых богатых людей и попробуем разложить так называемых ветеранов Forbes да, российского, которые в нем присутствуют много лет, и сравнить их рост благосостояния с индексом РТС российского рынка, то мы видим, что они росли в три раза больше, чем РТС. То есть это прямой ответ на вопрос, что окей, цены на нефть колеблется, индекс РТС тоже колеблется, но эти люди они зарабатывают в три раза больше. А дальше мы попробуем разложить, отвечая на ваш вопрос, куда бы можно было бы инвестировать, за счет чего они зарабатывают в три раза больше, чем РТС. И есть несколько ключевых факторов. Я бы сказал так, первое. Да? Первый – это консолидация отраслей. И я бы привел несколько таких простых примеров. Вот был Новороссийский порт. Это сотни компаний, которые каждый занимался какими-то маленькими своими кусочками. Это бизнес достаточно криминальный. Это бизнес абсолютно непрозрачный и абсолютно не платящий налогов. Пришел инвестор, который жесткой рукой навел порядок. И он консолидировал этот порт в одно юридическое лицо. Навел там полный порядок, сделал международную отчетность и вывел на IPO. Эта компания была единственная компания на Emerging Market, 
инфраструктурный порт, который был выведен на IPO. Сколько заработали инвесторы? Инвесторы заработали миллиард долларов. Да? Значит, второй пример. Сейчас, ну, как только что мы обсуждали, банковский сектор. В банковском секторе достаточно много долгов, и он плохо управляется. Если банковский сектор консолидировать профессиональными игроками, то появляются крупные игроки, которые более четко понимают, как создавать value, как работают скоринговые модели, как зарабатывать деньги. Через консолидацию создается стоимость, и инвесторы зарабатывают. Соответственно, это вот первый сегмент. Да? Второй сегмент, на который бы я смотрел, это улучшение качества корпоративного управления в государственных структурах или в крупных структурах с значительным государственным участием. Далеко не секрет, что довольно часто компании с крупным государственным участием неэффективно управляются. Если мы приводим в эти компании крупных инвесторов, которые внедряют современные практики управления, повышают corporate governance, автоматически растет стоимость. И здесь Примеров миллионы, да, то есть это те же самые 2000-е годы, да, довольно многие иностранные инвесторы э, занимались так называемыми active financing, да, то есть они покупали миноритарные пакеты в крупных компаниях, находили их неэффективности, делали их публичными, и эти компании реформировались на пользу э, государству. Если говорить, например, российский пример, ну вот самый последний пример, которым я занимался, это да, аэропорт Шереметьево. В аэропорте Шереметьево основной акционер э, был государства. Мы, как частные инвесторы, посмотрели, что э, мы можем реально создать value, если мы построим дополнительный пассажирский терминал, дополнительные подземные переходы и консолидируем бизнес весь аэропортовый, который наполовину основной бизнес государственный, другой бизнес, очень много бизнесов вокруг аэропортовых негосударственных, такие как транспортный бизнес, э, то есть это карго бизнес, э, duty free, реклама, гостиницы и так далее. И дальше получилось так, что если инвестор инвестирует миллиард долларов, наводит порядок, строит новые терминалы, четко совершенно с западными инвесторами, мы, западными консультантами из BCG мы отработали, какая бизнес-модель, какой пассажиропоток, как мы обслуживаем лучших клиентов авиакомпании, как мы создаем value. И таким образом получается реформирование государственной структуры, когда входит в государственную структуру инвестор, причем это инфраструктура структурный проект, да, огромное государственного значения. Но частный инвестор вносит свой миллиард долларов живых денег, улучшается value, который создает аэропорт, и, соответственно, улучшается качество инфраструктуры для, для страны. Это второе направление, на которое бы я смотрел. Третье направление, на которое я посмотрел, это то, что я говорил, все новое. Да? И здесь достаточно простой пример – банк Тиньков. Банк Тиньков на настоящий момент – это крупнейший онлайн-банк в мире. Запущен с абсолютного нуля. То есть господин Тиньков занимался совершенно другими бизнесами, не банковскими всю жизнь. В свое время взял себе консультантов, они посмотрели на рынок, и он построил по примеру, который он подсмотрел у нас в Силиконовой долине в Стэнфорде, рынок банковских карт. И он построил банк, который не имеет ни одного отделения. При этом этот банк сейчас оценивается в миллиард долларов. И я считаю, что такие возможности совершенно точно вот по этим всем трем направлениям есть в Казахстане, и их нужно реализовывать. И на них можно заработать значительно больше, чем рынок РТС, ну, рынок местный растет, да, и чем э, волатильность на нефть. Я думаю, что... Спасибо. Здравствуйте. Меня Руслан зовут, спасибо спикерам. У меня специфический вопрос. В Казахстане в основном private equity занимается государство, нацкомпанией. Вот. И так получается, что... Sorry, we can't... Uh, can you turn on your mic, please? The translators need you to так have the mic turned on. Да, да. И нацкомпании... А, меня, меня зовут Руслан, и спасибо спикерам. Я хотел э, спросить, спросить следующий специфический вопрос. В Казахстане в private equity занимается в основном государство. И госкомпании э, создавали и создают дочки-фонды private equity для того, чтобы решить вопрос у своих э, distressed assets, которые есть в группе. И мой вопрос такой, э, помогает ли... Такое как бы создание, решить вопрос distressed assets, то что в группе создается другой private equity фонд и uh, debt переходит в equity и так далее, и так далее. 
Вот, это, если и вопрос второй, если это помогает, то как должен быть структурирован такой фонд? То есть это должна быть коптивная команда или это должна быть внешне независимая команда? Я бы вот хотел адресовать этот вопрос вот к Павлу и к Тимуру с учетом ваших, вашего российского опыта и вашего зарубежного опыта. И второй вопрос у меня к Тимуру. Какие у Blackstones виды на Казахстан? Ну, очень такой важный вопрос. Я этой тематикой достаточно много занимался. Я когда вернулся после Штатов, после Стэнфорда в Россию, как раз возглавил такой фонд, который Distress Tessets в Промсвязьбанке, и, соответственно, он образовался из-за огромного количества активов, которые банк кредитовал. И это было больше ста отраслей, и мы не знали, что с ними делать. И здесь, отвечая на ваш вопрос, да, это коптивная команда, но это команда, как я вот говорил, да, то есть, как я люблю, люди, которые прекрасно понимают, как создается value и как западное образование, западный опыт, но любящие и не боящиеся специфики России. Дальше структурирование этой вещи. Самое главное, это какие вы ставите Key Performance Indicators, да, как, как вы мотивируете команду. Главное, мотивировать команду от создания стоимости, то есть как вы создаете shareholder value. И вы смотрите, окей, у вас есть банковские активы, банковские активы на рынке оцениваются times to book value of equity. Да? Вы должны мотивировать этот банк создавать book value of equity. Неважно, как рынок будет расти или падать, но вы понимаете, что банк, если он растет book value of equity, то он растет в цене. А в медиа, например, бизнесе, который мы медиа, один из крупнейших холдингов построили, будет важно и беда. Да, и медиакомпании Times to и беда они оцениваются. Дальше вы смотрите набор с точки зрения управления, очень важно, как вы управляете. Да? То есть, если вы сверху пытаетесь все вопросы решить, у вас диверсифицированный холдинг, ну, как иногда шутят, да, наверху пытаются утвердить, сколько туалетной бумаги покупать. У вас не будет никакой эффективности. То есть наверху у вас должна быть очень компактная команда, как в private equity фондах в западных, которая состоит из инвестиционных профессионалов, то есть таких так называемых инвестиционных директоров, каждый из которых курирует один-два актива максимум. И управление идет через советы директоров, через corporate governance и через метрики, которые вы ставите менеджменту, чтобы он исполнял эти цели, которые вы поставили. И дальше очень важно следить за качеством менеджмента в этих ваших компаниях. То есть вы, по сути, наверху контролируете, как вы, э, у вас растет ваш капитал, за счет каких факторов, какая стратегия у этих компаний, вы участвуете в выработке стратегии и работаете, с, э, чтобы у вас эффективно работал совет директоров. А дальше вся основная ответственность за управление этими компаниями лежит на менеджменте, на генеральных директорах. Но вы должны уметь быстро их увольнять и быстро их менять, иначе у вас изменений не будет. И дальше Вопрос из этих distressed assets нужно четко проранжировать. Вот из этих 100 активов, которые у вас есть, плохие. Как я вот ну, в свое время общался с, с Роснано и ну, в другими крупными структурами российскими, довольно часто мы, когда возглавляем такие структуры, мы видим очень много проблем. И первое, на что есть соблазн броситься руководителю, это на решение проблем. То есть там, где красное, там, где горит, там, где взрывается. Вот это большая ошибка. Нужно стратегически понять, вот из этих активов мы можем что-то большое вырастить, ну, условно говоря, телеком-компанию новую, или промышленный холдинг. Нам нужно заниматься его реструктурированием. Мы из него что-то можем большое построить или нет? Если мы понимаем, что вот этот вот рыбоперерабатывающий условный завод, да, или там какая-нибудь кондитерская фабрика нам не нужна, потому что она маленькая, ее лучше продать на рынке, может быть, даже зафиксировать у убыток, ну, даже, скорее всего, зафиксировать убыток. Но, с другой стороны, не решать э, вот эти красные флажки и тушить эти все пожары бешеные, которые возникать будут всегда в таком э, в проблемном э, портфеле. С другой стороны, сконцентрироваться на тех четко отраслях, определить, которые будут расти и которые вы четко совершенно строите, бросить туда основные усилия, и тогда у вас, ну, есть такое понятие, все, наверное, на MBA учились, да, санк кост. Санк кост, он на то и санк кост. Это деньги потрачены, они уже утонули. Да? Что с лодкой случилось? Она утонула. Да? То есть нужно понимать, что лодка утонула. Все. И вы тогда должна концентрироваться на то, что не утонуло, а то, что наоборот вырастет. И тогда вы реально из этого портфеля distressed funds, в том числе банковских, создаете очень большой value. И тогда он может выстроить.
Ну, вот, мне кажется, так я бы ответил. Я признаюсь честно, я конкретно с казахстанской спецификой знаком не близко, поэтому ответ дам теоретически. Я думаю, что вывод активов, которые испытывают финансовые трудности в отдельное управление, это, конечно, правильное решение. А как это структурировать, это вопрос каждого отдельного случая. Я думаю, что в большинстве случаев правильное решение, когда активы испытывают трудности, это организованная процедура банкротства, смена владения, смена управления. И, соответственно, ответ на ваш вопрос, какая должна быть команда у таких активов. Команда может быть внутренняя, может быть внешняя, но она всегда должна быть новая. Потому что если активы испытывают трудности, значит существующая команда по каким-то причинам избрала неверную стратегию. Следовательно, смена руководства – это логичный шаг. Я думаю, что, опять же, не знаком с конкретными деталями, но я думаю, что обычно это как раз и происходит. Поэтому, в принципе, логичная, логичный подход. Thank you. А, как Каникет сказал вначале, я, к сожалению, не могу комментировать от имени Блэкстоуна, а, поэтому... А, на второй вопрос, второй вопрос оставлю без ответа. Great. We have two last very quick questions. One in the back and then you, sir. And then we're going to have a quick wrap up and then move on to the presentation. So please make your questions brief and the answers brief as well. Здравствуйте, меня зовут Абзал Саманов, я возглавляю компанию Energy Z. У меня два вопроса. Первый вопрос к Айдану Карибжанову. Как вы, как инвестор, оцениваете перспективы рынка недвижимости Астаны. Если бы вы зашли в этот бизнес, какой уровень доходности вы сочли бы приемлемым? И второй вопрос к Павлу. Вы упомянули компанию Тиньков, которая работает без отделений. Как вы считаете, возможно ли составить... Первый вопрос к Айдану Карибжанову. Как вы оцениваете перспективы рынка недвижимости Астаны? И если бы вы вошли в этот бизнес, как бы вы, какой уровень доход, доходности вы сочли бы приемлемым? Второй вопрос к Павлу. Вы сказали о Тинькофф банке, который работает без отделения. Если бы, возможно ли, как вы считаете, создать похожую компанию на рынке недвижимости, работать без отделений? Я быстро отвечу. Мы практически не работаем на рынке недвижимости. Не потому, что это плохой рынок, это большой интересный рынок, просто мы не видим там наших конкурентных преимуществ. Чтобы быть девелопером, нужно обладать специфической экспертизой. Что греха таить, нужно иметь какие-то близкие отношения с местной властью, нужно получать какие-то специальные условия. Но это, это работа, это как бы экспертиза, которой мы не владеем. И поэтому по поводу этого, а что будет с рынком недвижимости в Астане, я, я не могу сказать, потому что я не являюсь специалистом в этом. А, я не совсем понял вопрос компании по недвижимости без отделений. А, что это такое? Попробую предположить. Да, а, в той же самой Силиконовой долине было несколько стартапов, которые были очень успешно проданы недавно, а, которые занимаются недвижимостью, посредничеством, да, то есть которые заменяют собой риэлторов. А, и, а, я немного знаком с этим рынком, потому что Промсис Капитал в свое время покупал компанию ЦИАН, и эта компания ЦИАН сейчас один из крупнейших игроков на российском рынке. То есть это объявление о недвижимости. Но вопрос в том, что да, можно ли такие компании создавать, я уверен, что можно. Я думаю, что наверняка они есть в Казахстане. С другой стороны, с точки зрения проблем, которые я вижу, это проблемы скорее, как вы создадите систему, которая будет автоматически обновлять данные, которые будут удалять данные об избыточных квартирах или об избыточных объектах недвижимости. Другой момент – это публичность данных о сделках, потому что, к сожалению, то, что мы видим в России, если сравнивать с Соединенными Штатами Америки, то у нас нет открытого, открытой базы данных по фактическим параметрам сделки. Соответственно, вы не можете более четко определять, какая стоимость объектов недвижимости выставляется, какая она более справедливая, какая несправедливая. Если эти вопросы решаются, то да, такие компании можно построить. И, как мы видим это на примере Соединенных Штатов, когда любой покупатель может зайти и посмотреть не только объекты в конкретном 
в конкретной локации, но еще увидеть темпы роста преступности, какие соседи, какой средний доход компании или жилья и так далее. Но я пока не сильно вижу, что вот у нас это скоро появится. Эрлан Асманов, Верни Капитал. If I may, it's not a question, just very small comment. Please. Can you hear? Yeah. Okay. okay. Russian, I wanted to say. Oh, you're going to do Russian? Yeah. Can you hear? Yeah. Russian. Okay. Um, мы услышали сегодня про особенности про этой кути рынка наших стран. It's working. Okay, I'll say in English. We we, we were talking about uh, the private equity market here in Russia and Kazakhstan, and also we know that. Uh, when banking financing is not available, this is the uh, private equity should play its role. But in Kazakhstan, to create a classical institutional private equity firm or fund, due to the local legislation, is almost impossible. Because local legislation is very, very strict. It's rather hedge fund legislation, but not private equity. So that's comment for you, my colleagues. Great. Does anyone want on the panel to make a final comment before I sum up the discussion and move into the, the final presentation? Some last words from our panelists. No? Well, thank you very much. I've, I've tried to summarize our discussion in 10 points, so let me quickly go through them. Number one is that Kazakhstan is at the center as we heard today, of major global trends. A transition of power from west to east or north to south, a change in the use of commodities, and a global imperative towards infrastructure and infrastructure spending. All of these dynamics will have an impact on positively and negatively on this economy going forward. The second point is that PE, we heard, is not singular. And it's not a panacea towards all the problems and challenges and, and opportunities of the economy, but it can be helpful. And it can be particularly helpful in bringing new technologies, new ideas, new ways of thinking about business strategy and so forth. The third point that we heard today is that private equity is a tool. And it's a tool for a certain type of opportunity. Really, that, and, the, and the tool has two important dynamics to it. One is that the opportunity has to fit within a certain time scale. And secondly, is that it's an opportunity that needs customization and customized capital and solutions. The fourth point we heard today is that government can and does play a strategic role in allowing for private equity capital to come in, and that one of the differentiation factors of Kazakhstan is you have a strategic government here that's really thinking long term about the economy and its own development. The fifth point we heard is around this paradox of the oil and gas and mineral sector in general. And that on the one hand, if you are an investor in Kazakhstan, at some level you have to believe in the oil and gas story. And on the other hand, if you do believe that, are there not other opportunities around the world where you can play that uh, in a better way? And related to that is that was the debate that we heard that there are opportunities, and many of them, that exist outside of oil and gas, and that we shouldn't just view the opportunity set here as one in the natural resources space. The sixth point is around two major challenges that we heard. One is around exits and the lack of a IPO market and experience in that space. And the second is around deal flow. Seventh point I heard is that there is no perfect deal. Each one of these requires uh, a, a new frameworks, new tools, a lot of customization, uh, a lot of real due diligence and work. It's not just going to be served to you on a platter. And so if you're looking for an easy uh, one-stop shop, uh, uh, this is not the place for it. But if you do the work, you'll find good investment opportunities. The eighth point is around human capital. And we had a great debate around, which I would love to actually go into in, in, in a further conversation around the importance of local knowledge versus not. 
in, in terms of the global tools that we have, and the importance of Western education versus not, and a, and a real examination of what are the human capital that is needed for good investment in Kazakhstan. The ninth uh, point that I heard is, is the importance of technology and innovation, and that you can view technology and innovation, and you should view it not just as a discrete sector, but something that permeates across industry today, and it's a real leverage point where private capital and private capital managers can bring new ideas, new technologies to transform industries. And tenth and final point, which we didn't hear enough of because I didn't guide the conversation there as, as well as I should have, but that regional integration of Central Asia is a in, very important catalyst for this part of the world over the next 30, 50 years with the Belt and Road Initiative and other such initiatives. And secondly, that this is, all of this is happening in the context of a global transition towards a low carbon future. We don't know at what pace that'll happen, but there is a global impetus for that to happen, and Kazakhstan will sit in between uh, uh, and as part of that transition. So that's my best attempt to summarize what's been a phenomenal discussion. I wanted to thank you all uh, for your comments, perspectives, wisdom, experience, and once again thank our hosts at Kazana Cap Capital Management for having us here. So before we truly end, I'm going to turn it over to Roland who's going to give a quick presentation and a briefing to all of us on one investment fund that is really trying to do this in practice. So over to you. Thank you all very much. So uh, thank you very much to Aniket and to uh, KCM in general to, for giving me the opportunity to steal time away from this uh, amazing panel to talk about one particular uh, investment opportunity, uh, the Kazakhstan Infrastructure Fund. You know, when, when you decide to start uh, a fund, particularly something that's in private equity, you're really committing to your, you're really committing yourself and your team to. Oh, it's not on. I think you need to bend your knees a little. <laughs> <laughs> Too tall. <laughs> okay, thank you. Is that better? So you're really committing yourself when you start a fund, particularly a private equity fund, to a 10-year uh, project. Uh, from the moment when you start investing to when you finally disinvest. And 10 years is a long time in somebody's life, let alone their career. So you have to be, I think, 100% certain about why you're going into starting that fund uh, to begin with. And I think that there are um, three questions that you really need to answer in order to make that decision uh, about starting the fund and committing yourself for 10 years. The first is why are you making those investments? The second is how are you going to make those investments? And the third is with whom will you actually um, be, uh, be, be investing alongside? So the first, why, uh, is, is I think the most important. If you know why you're choosing the particular asset class that you're, that you're looking at, then you're able to think in terms of that 10-year horizon and make the right type of investment decisions. And as importantly, um, you're, able to, you're able to attract other investors into that asset class. You have to be 100% confident about that asset class if you're going to persuade other people to come into it. So I think it's the most important question. And I also think that it's, it's actually probably the easiest question to answer in terms of Kazakhstan and, and, and an infrastructure fund. Now, we've heard on this panel a lot today about why you might think about investing into Kazakhstan. So I'm not going to repeat that. But just in, um, in, in, in very... Uh, to, to simplify the, the discussion in a, in a huge way. You know, today in Kazakhstan, particularly on the infrastructure side, there's a huge 
demand for capital. There's enormous opportunity to invest into infrastructure, uh, particularly with relation to this one belt, one road uh, concept. The, the numbers that are being talked about, I'm sure everybody here has heard, they're in the tens and even hundreds of billions of dollars. So the opportunity to, to put capital to work here is very high from a, from a, from a basic standpoint. Secondly, the supply of capital globally has never been higher. The cost of capital globally is, is, is very low. What's missing between that demand and that supply is a conduit for investing. And that is essentially what private equity and financial markets in general uh, is all about. And, and being able to work to bring that capital into a country like Kazakhstan is the opportunity to create value. And therefore, I think the reason why you should be looking at investing into Kazakhstan and in particular uh, into infrastructure. So that's on the why side. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Secondly, on how. How do you invest? Even if you, even if you get the, the why question right about why you should be investing into an asset class, you can still get it wrong by doing it in the, in, in the wrong way. Uh, so you have to be sure about how you're going to be um, investing. And for that, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my organization, Verno, uh, not Verni, but Verno uh, Capital. We are a 100% um, privately owned, completely independent uh, partnership um, that specializes in two key areas. The first area that we specialize in is that we only invest into the former Soviet Union, into Russia and, uh, and, and Kazakhstan. That's where our expertise uh, lies. Uh, we have around 50 professionals um, across our geographies, uh, primarily based out of Moscow, but recently having opened a, an office in Astana, focusing on investing into, uh, into this region. So that's the first speciality. The second speciality is that we cater to international institutions. So what we try and do is take the opportunities that exist in um, a sometimes idiosyncratic uh, investment environment, a set of investment opportunities, and translate them into opportunities that international institutions can understand and therefore invest uh, into. And all of our clients are sovereign wealth funds, uh, international pension funds, university endowments, foundations, and, uh, and family offices. We do that uh, through having a mix of uh, Russian and expatriate um, uh, employees, uh, as I say, based out of Moscow. And what we try and do is we pair the local knowledge that you need, I think, to be invested into these markets with international standards of best practice. So our offices are in Moscow uh, and Astana, and we're regulated out of, uh, out of London. Can we move to the next slide, please? That process uh, of how to invest has, I think, been, um, you know, the, the, the success that we have had, I think, um, displays that we're, that we're going about this in the, in the right way. So we've managed to uh, invest since 2009, when we started Verno, about $1.5 billion into, uh, into, into Russia. And if you think about the period of time in which we have been working, the international crisis, commodity crises, uh, the sanctions against Russia, being able to bring $1.5 billion from international institutions and invest them into Russia, I think displays why what we're trying to do uh, works and that there is a role to be played by private companies um, bridging the gap between demand to invest into these countries and the opportunities that, uh, that exist. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, we have looked during the history of Verno, we've looked at over 200 different uh, opportunities in Russian private equity. Out of those 200 opportunities, we have so far invested into just eight. And I'm sure that the panel can sympathize with the amount of effort that you need to put in to looking at opportunities and actually putting them together into an investable opportunity before you can actually make um, 
to before you can actually make that investment. So we've looked at over 200 opportunities. We've invested into eight. Uh, we're agnostic in terms of the type of opportunities that we have been looking at. It's been across industry. What we have been looking for is opportunities which are uh, investable. So these are opportunities where the risks are, uh, are relatively clear, where we've worked with the counterparts so that we know that our interests are aligned with the management of that company, and where we, we understand the risks before we're, before, we're, uh, before we're taking part in the opportunity. And uh, in particular in Russia, and I think also in Kazakhstan, the, the, the rates of return that you can generate um, are always fairly high. It's managing the downside risk which really determines whether something is going to be successful or not. And that's what we've been focusing on. So, can we go to the next slide, please? So, answered the first question about why, we talked about the second question about um, how. And the third, and I think also crucial question to answer, is with whom? If you're going to enter into a 10-year investment horizon, you better be very certain about the counterparts with whom you're going to be building uh, that business. And when we started Verno in 2009, we were uh, very fortunate to be partnered by a strategic wealth fund out of Abu Dhabi. Uh, they made certain commitments to us. Um, at the beginning of that relationship, and they have more than fulfilled those commitments over the last uh, now eight years. And it's been a result of having worked very closely with them and built up that relationship over time that's allowed us to invest uh, $1.5 billion into a very difficult uh, investment environment. Coming into Kazakhstan, we are aiming to build a similar type of relationship with, uh, with KCM and Biterec, and we very much hope uh, that we will be able to marry the expertise that exists within KCM and Biterec with the strategies and understanding and experience that we have on investing through private equity in this part of the world. And that partnership, the expertise and technologies that we bring, and the, uh, the opportunities and understanding and help that we can get from our partners at KCM and Biteric will determine whether um, this will be a success or not. And I have to say that we started this uh, fund in uh, the end of April, sorry, the end of February of this year. And the first four months that we've been working um, in Kazakhstan, we've already managed to examine 28 different investment opportunities, of which eight we're taking to the stage where we think it could be um, investable. And the speed and actual efficiency with which we've been able to work with our partners at uh, KCM um, has quite frankly been a, a, a pl very pleasant surprise uh, uh, to me um, in the building of, uh, of, of our partnership with um, KCM and Biteric. So I think um, very clearly we're in the right place in terms of investment. I think we have the right team to be successful and I think we're, we're working with the right people. And uh, if you put that together, then I think it's a, um, a secret for, for, for success. So I'd like to finish by saying that if anybody in this audience has any investment opportunities that they would like to discuss with me or my team, we're very happy to talk to them. Uh, and equally, if they'd like to learn more about the Kazakh Infrastructure Fund, then uh, I'm very happy to, uh, uh, to take those questions as well. But I don't want to keep everybody from lunch any longer, so I'm going to uh, finish there. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you all very much for spending your late morning with us and hope you have a great rest of the forum. Thanks. Акционерное общество Казана Капитал Менеджмент – казахстанский фонд фондов прямых инвестиций. Создан в 2007 году для содействия устойчивому развитию национальной экономики. Приоритетами для Казана Капитал Менеджмент является формирование инфраструктуры private equity в Казахстане, привлечение иностранных инвестиций в несырьевые сектора экономики. 
Фонды семейства «Казана Капитал Менеджмент» предоставляют капитал компаниям в различных секторах экономики с целью дальнейшего роста и повышения конкурентоспособности. 70% инвестиций «Казана Капитал Менеджмент» вложены в экономику Казахстана. Общие инвестиции фондов в экономику Казахстана составили 400 миллионов долларов США, из которых более 180 миллионов долларов США представлены средствами «Казана Капитал Менеджмент». Более 30 проектов профинансировано в Казахстане в широком диапазоне отраслей. 100% инвестиций «Казана Капитал Менеджмент» в Казахстане направлено в сырьевой сектор. Совокупный объем чистой прибыли «Казана Капитал Менеджмент» за 10 лет составил 56 миллиардов тенге. «Казана Капитал Менеджмент» – фонд эффективных решений. 10 лет от инвестиций к примножению капитала. Фонд входит в структуру акционерного общества «Национальный управляющий холдинг Бетерек. Kazuna Capital Management is a Kazakhstan.